Okay, we can uh, go ahead and start. Uh, thanks to everybody for logging in. Uh, the topic tonight is is on melons, and I know a lot of our growers uh, they do struggle with with producing quality watermelons, cantaloupes, and other melons on a consistent basis. And so I asked uh, Dr. Natalie Bumgarner from the University of Tennessee to talk to us about melons in the garden. I think she may touch on some other vine and plants as well. Um, so I want to thank her for being here and speaking with us. Uh, Dr. Natalie Bumgarner is the Extension Specialist for Residential and Consumer Horticulture at the University of Tennessee. So, uh, so again, thanks for speaking with us, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much. Well, I'm really glad to be able to visit with y'all this evening. I am actually based out of Knoxville, so you're in a slightly different growing region than I am, but not that far away. And so um, I'm actually a, a West Virginia native by birth. So I've uh, spent a lot of time going back and forth between home in, you know, both Kentucky and Virginia. So this is going to be kind of a, a little bit of a buffet of some of the vine crop work that I've done here in Tennessee over the last few years. And um, as, as Phil said, I work with both our mass gardener program and with our residential and consumer horticulture program all throughout the state of Tennessee. So this is, you know, very much information that is developed for gardeners, but also in many instances by gardeners. And so I'm going to share with you a little bit about some of our home garden variety trials and some of the information as far as cultivars and things like that is absolutely going to be from trial evaluations and reports and feedbacks that feedback that we've gotten from gardeners across the state. So um, I'm pretty low key when it comes to presentations. So if there's any questions or anything that I maybe didn't say all that clearly or made you think of something else, feel free to pop it in the uh, chat box and, you know, Phil, Jeremy, like, feel free to interrupt me if there's something timely. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about cucurbits, um, then some of the favorites from our home garden variety trials, and then we'll delve just a little bit deeper into some of the nuances of melons, specifically muskmelons and watermelons. And so the cucurbit family, there are many, many species, and actually they potentially came into production um, in several different parts of the world. So uh, watermelons from Africa, you know, some others, um, India is thought to be the home of uh, cucumbers. So they are a herbaceous annual, very warm season crop. And as a general statement, their flowers are manicious, but there are some nuances in there. And so these are uh, summer squash and always a good example to kind of point out uh, different floral parts. So here on the left, we have the female flower. You can see kind of that uh, fused stigma there over here on the right. We have the male flower. And so we can see, um, you know, the anther there shedding pollen. And so this pollination uh, process will be a key part of a lot of the production of our cucurbits. However, there are some nuances to uh, different crops in the cucurbit family in the way that they flower and set fruit. And so when we talk about muskmelons, we'll talk about this concept of andromanesius. And so they have both male flowers and perfect flowers, still uh, require some bee pollination there. Then in the area of cucumbers, which we don't, we won't talk a, a bunch about, but I did I uh, just want to mention there are, um, and this is an example there in the back of the screen, these are long English cucumbers grown in a greenhouse. And so if we have seedless cucumbers, typically what that is, is a plant that has just set female flowers, Gyonaceous, and it can form a fruit, which is an enlarged ovary without fertilization. So that kind of gives us our seedless cucumbers. So when it comes to uh, flowers, there could be some differences in the cucurbit family. They do have one thing that's uh, very similar for most, except the, you know, some of the summer squashes. They also have uh, tendrils, which in and of themselves are a pretty cool uh, plant part in their ability to twine. Um, and while as a general statement, um, you know, summer squash, cucumbers are not exactly the most nutrient dense things that we could grow in our garden when it comes to watermelons, they are that um, red is the same pigment, so like a bean that makes tomatoes red. 
And when we tar start talking about muskmelons, we get into some of the vitamin A uh, types of um, compounds. And so there are some valuable nutrients when we get into the uh, melon family. So with that kind of broad uh, general overview, I want to jump in and share a little bit with you about some of the favorite cultivars that have been grown in our Tennessee trials. And so a lot of this information that I'm gonna share with you actually comes from our home garden variety trial, which we are actually now in our fifth year. So we started this in 2017 and essentially it is a citizen science home garden variety trialing program. And so each year we select uh, paired comparisons of all kinds of different garden crops, a lot of them warm season crops because those are the easiest to get out and ship as far as timing. And so our gardeners just select what it is that they would like to grow and they grow two cultivars within each trial that are similar but different in some key characteristics. And so a, a lot of this you know, first level section of information that I'm gonna be showing you is uh, evaluations from those variety trials. And so we ask people to rate the, both of those cultivars on a scale of one to 10. We ask them to give us uh, a percentage of whether or not they would recommend that cultivar to other home gardeners in Tennessee and mark which one was better on characteristics like yield, plant health, appearance, taste, and those types of factors. So um, in addition, of course, to the work that I do with our citizen scientists, often there are about 150 up to 200 folks that participate in that trial. I also do trial work here at one of our research stations in Knoxville. So many of the pictures and some of the data that I'll be sharing with you would be from the field trials that I do here at one of our research stations. There's some uh, honest to goodness, Tennessee red clay right there. You can see um, we're, we're pretty legit here in Knoxville. And so when it comes to cucumbers, they are one of the vine crops that we tend to get good participation and very good feedback from our home garden trialers. And this is maybe one of my favorite sets of data. This was the very first year that we did our home garden trial. And um, I tried to pick cultivars that were difference in age and difference in disease resistance. Um, and at that point in time, Downy Mildew was, and of course still is one of the challenges that we deal with with no, the crops. And so this cultivar right here was about the best downy mildew resistance that you could get on the market. And we compared it against straight eight elite. Straight eight's been on the market since the 1930s. And so, you know, I, as a researcher was thinking, well, you know, this will be interesting. We'll see how people like these new disease resistant cultivars. And the response from our trailers was that they didn't all that much. And so, to me, this was kind of the perfect statement to be able to say, you don't know until you trial. And so this was really the basis for what kept us going and making sure that we were not only doing our own yield and productivity trials, but making sure that what we were promoting and sharing was truly preferred by gardeners across the state of Tennessee. So some of our favorite cucumbers over the past few years in the seedless category or thin skin, I guess I, I shouldn't necessarily always say seedless because if you're growing a lot, many different kinds of cultivars in your garden and some of these uh, seedless cultivars are cross-pollinated with um, pollen from another cucumber, they will not necessarily be seedless, but they are thin skinned, um, often low bitterness. Some of our favorites have been Diva, and um, the first one that we trialed last year, a newer cultivar, recent All-American Selections winner is Green Light. So those are both kind of snacker peppers. I mean, snacker cucumbers, good, you know, for, um, for kids and the uh, slightly, slightly older kids. So some of our favorite compact cucumbers, which tends to be one of our highest participation items. We have a lot of raised bed growers who participate in our trials. Space Master, Salad Mower, and patio snacker. And uh, here you can see um, those nice short inner nodes from some of our compact cucumbers. Some of our favorite slicers have been General Lee, a very good disease resistance package. Um, downy mildew resistant uh, 401 does have high uh, downy mildew resistance, but probably taste wise, it may not quite keep up with some of the older slicers 
Bristol and Market More 76. A cool customer was a pickle and cucumber that performed very well. And some of our favorite um, kind of novelty cucumbers have been Atachi, which is an um, Asian cucumber that is white, and Martini, which is a white cucumber that I grew for the first time last year and was one of the highest producers in our trial. So this is green light, and it was a very productive, one of the highest yielders in the trial last year. A lot of nice, small fruit. Um, the only thing that I will say about these thin-skinned cucumbers is that if you have cucumber beetle feeding issues, oftentimes you'll see the worst damage on these thin-skinned cucumbers. And the plots where I grow, we do tend to have heavy cucumber beetle feeding populations. This is Muncher, another one of those thin-skinned uh, cucumbers. So in addition to cucumbers, we also have a lot of great summer squash growers. And so each year we trial several zucchini as well as yellow squash. And so some of our favorites over the past few years have been Raven, definitely a standard when it comes to summer squash. Um, Easy Pick Green is a dark green zucchini that is parthenocarpic. And so it is nice for small space or urban growers or folks that may not have very much good pollinator activity in the area because it will set fruit without being fertilized. The other asset is if you have a lot of trouble with squash vine borer, you can literally cover your zucchini plants with a net to exclude that clear ring moth and still get fruit from easy pick green. Uh, desert is a disease resistant, uh, quite a few of the virus Virus, common viruses um, that we're seeing more impact in our cucurbits, uh, food resistance there. And then bossa nova, I'll show you a good picture of bossa nova. It's a multicolored um, modeled green zucchini. And then eight ball is a small kind of cue ball uh, type zucchini. Our folks have liked any of the yellow zucchinis. Um, we've had some good success with patty pans, so sunburst and all American selections winner. And then these are probably our three favorite yellow squash. So this is Easy Pick Green, and this was the 2019 trial. Um, that is uh, Parthenon right there, which is um, kind of a specialty um, zucchini that you can also certainly eat the flowers there, but Easy Pick Green was the favorite in our trial that year. Bossa Nova has done well in multiple years of trials. Uh, for us. So you can see almost an 8 out of 10 rating and over 80% of folks who would recommend it to other gardeners in Tennessee. It's an All-American Selections winner and you can see good viral disease resistance there. It is um, got kind of a fun multicolored green. Um, pretty good uh, bearing early to bear and good yield that we've seen in the trials. The Bossa Nova has often kept up with what would be our typical yield out of the green zucchini. These were um, the 2019 yellow zucchini. And um, I am continually surprised at how much people like the yellow zucchini. I think it's just the bright novel color. I wouldn't say they haven't out yielded the greens or any, um, any amazing metrics like that, but uh, folks have really seemed to like it. Easy pick gold, just as I was saying about easy pick green is also parthenocarpic. So that can be an asset. And 100% of our trialers would recommend them to others. When I talk about squash in our gardens in Tennessee, the one thing that I always like to point out is that in my trials and in the yield data that I've collected, I will typically see higher yield and a longer harvest season out of yellow squash than I will out of zucchini. On some years, quite dramatic. I think my 2020 plot trials, I had about double the yield out of the yellow zucchini that I did out of some of our yellow squash versus some of the zucchini. So um, they just tend to bear for longer and remain healthier in, in our plots. And these represent some of our favorite cultivars over the last few years. This is Zephyr right there on the left, sometimes completely green, but mostly it has a green tip. This is Tempest there in the center, kind of get that pretty multicolored uh, light yellow and darker yellow. And that is a selection, it's actually bred by Johnny's, but it was developed really for culinary uses. So it's generally um, gotten good reviews on uh, taste. And then last year, we also, our highest yielding yellow squash in the trial was a cultivar called Grand Prize. So those have been some of our uh, favorites. And we've typically, um, we've done some patty pans in the last couple of years. That's G-Star on the left, Benning's Green Tent, 
And, um, you know, we got pretty good ratings and, and similar yield to what I saw a lot of the zucchini and my plots in Knoxville. This is Sunburst from the year before. It was an All-American Selections winner. So a fun um, kind of novel um, patty pan squash. So with that uh, introduction to some of the cucurbit trials, I wanna now um, kind of dive in and just talk a little bit more specifically about melons in our gardens. And so we'll, we'll start with, uh, now melon is just a really general term for kind of the fruit of, uh, of cucurbits, but we'll use melons uh, to talk about kind of that whole cantaloupe, honeydew and uh, musk melon family. And so within melons, there's kind of two main groups, probably what we grow the most often and what I definitely have the most trial information about. is kind of this uh, cantaloupe group and that covers both netted um, and non-netted. Um, and then the inodorous group contains some of the canary melons, some of the honeydews. Oftentimes those are referred to as winter melons. Now we don't typically grow those quite as much in our part of the country for a range of reasons. They tend to be longer to harvest. And so oftentimes they're grown in parts of the country that have very long cropping seasons. As a general statement, they tend to prefer kind of lower humidity um, and uh, more semi-arid conditions and, um, and very warm temperatures. Uh, daytime temps there if if given the opportunity. So we'll we'll spend a little bit more time talking about this uh, cantalopensis group. Um, so of course this is the the critical um, discussion. What are we talking about? Cantaloupes or musk melons? And so sometimes in our conversation it's almost more of a geographical descriptor, but it really used to have much more of a uh, basis in the crops themselves. So cantaloupes typically used to refer to western melons, which tend to be grown in arid regions. They had more uh, smooth um, netting, uh, smooth as in not ribbed. Um, they were more round and they tended to be that three to five uh, pound range. Um, they were a little bit firmer flesh and were better for shipping overall. Musk melon, kind of the old fashioned terminology referred more to eastern melons, that were grown in our more humid climate. They tended to be more ribbed, a little bit larger and had softer flesh and were not as much of a shipping melon. But regardless of which one of those uh, you talk about, uh, most of these tend to produce both male and perfect flowers. And even though um, they are a little bit more closely related to cucumbers than some of the other uh, cucurbits, they won't cross with cucumbers. Um, so that's a little bit of the history behind the cantaloupe or musk melon discussion. Um, as uh, time has passed, a lot kind of what has happened is some of those Western characteristics that have been beneficial have been bred into some of what would be a old fashioned musk melon. So lots of times you might see things referred to as like an Eastern melon improved. So Athena or um, some of those really common melons that many of our both homeowners and commercial producers might grow would have maybe a little bit firmer flesh for a little bit better shipping or holding, but might still be of the size, you know, that might be uh, characteristically thought of as, as a musk melon. So there's quite a bit of crossover there now. Um, one of the kind of key differences between those two groups, our winter melons and our cantaloupes would be whether or not they slip when ripe. And so this is actually one of the reasons for our home garden variety trial. I like to grow musk melons because for early stage growers, being able to walk people through how melons slip is one of the simplest ways to kind of teach people how to define maturity. And so what does it really mean? Well, it means when that melon is ripe and you give it a little tug, it detaches from the vine very easily. And you'll also see when these fruit get ripe, their background skin color will turn from green to a little bit more yellow. So there is a color change, but the slipping is a really nice way to be able to characterize ripeness. So for most of us in our home gardens, we would harvest at what we would call full slip. Um, sometimes for folks who are gonna be selling those, 
marketing them, they might harvest a quarter or half slip, but for us, um, fully detaching and breaking off very easily would be one of the key aspects of ripeness. So when I think of what would be an old fashioned melon, here you have a very large, very um, deeply ribbed melon. And so this is actually a picture from our trials in 2019. And we grew what was an heirloom cultivar called the old time Tennessee musk melon. And these things really are about as big as it looks like from that picture. So they were 15 or 20 pounds, some of the big ones that we harvested, they got smaller as the season wore on and they were really fun. I can see though why the marketing would be a challenge for some of these. So this would definitely, um, and you, when these muskmelons got ripe, you could literally smell them from feet away. I remember the, this was our largest fruit. And so we'd been watching it for a while, excited about when it was going to be ripe in our plots. And the undergraduate who worked with me that summer, who was doing a lot of the day to day management of the plots, you know, um, was texting me about, when do we know? When do we know when this is ripe? And I remember the morning she sent me a text and she was like, I think it's ripe. I can smell it from several feet away. And so um, that's kind of our old classic uh, Southern muskmelon. These would be the inodorous group. And so this whole range of non-slipping melons. And these are a little bit harder to tell when they're going to be mature. And, um, and most of these, of course, then would require being cut off the vine when mature, but they do keep longer and, and those types of things. You can see a little bit of cucumber beetle feeding damage there on that stem. Um, so what have been some of the favorites in our trials? Oh, I should say also that in kind of commercial language, um, it's more common to now just refer to all of these as cantaloupes because the term musk is kind of often has a negative connotation. And so they're trying to separate this more negative uh, term muskmelon. But I often find when I talk to gardeners and folks in kind of our Mid-South region that if I say muskmelon, they know that I'm talking about what, what they really like to grow in their garden. So I still often use that term. In our first year, we trialed Athena and Sarah's Choice, which is a Johnny's cultivar, which is very sweet, probably a little bit firmer flesh than what would be um, some of our old fashioned musk melons. And Athena kind of um, edged out Sarah's Choice. Both of these cultivars have fusarium and some powdery mildew resistance. Um, so you can see 75% of uh, folks would have recommended Athena. In that year, I had a few ambrosia melons that I was growing in the plots and I fed these to folks at field days and things like that. So I did some informal taste testing and the ambrosia did very well. So you'll hear about ambrosia just a little bit uh, later in the trial. Um, so two years later, I went back to those good reviews that we got from ambrosia and decided to um, pull it back and do it in our 2019 trial. And so this is ambrosia, they are kind of on the top. Um, you can see a little bit lighter flesh color, a very moist seed cavity. That's also a little bit of a difference between our Eastern and our Western melons. Um, you can see a little bit drier seed cavity there. And this melon at the bottom is trifecta. And trifecta is coming out of the Cornell breeding program. It has um, probably the best downy mildew resistance that you can get on the market and also some bacterial wilt resistance, which is actually one of the biggest struggles that I've had in our melon trials. And this was another one of those, you don't know what people are going to prefer until you actually ask them. And so this was kind of the blowout of our 2019 trial. Ambrosia was far and away uh, preferred, 9.5 out of a 10, one of the highest ratings that we've ever gotten and 100% of people would recommend it. Um, I will say that I did get you know, good yields out of the ambrosia that year. So in our replicated uh, trials in Knoxville, it, it also did well. Um, so those are kind of our traditional sized muskmelons that we trialed. We've also done some small muskmelon trials. And so this was Minnesota Midget is an heirloom. And then Sugar Cube is a newer hybrid that has both some fusarium and powdery, powdery mildew resistance. Um, but in this instance, so you can see kind of a reverse of what some of our other trials have been, is the newer hybrid was definitely the preferred cultivar in yield and flavor. 
and uh, and in the rating. I think one of the biggest challenges that people had, and this was true even in our own plots in Knoxville, was the Minnesota midget went from ripe to overripe so quickly that people were just missing it and uh, losing the quality of the fruit. So a couple of years later, we came back and trialed sugar cube again. It's something that we do quite frequently in our trials. Um, it's kind of uh, things that have performed well. We try to find something else that might be good competition for them. And so in our 2020 trial, we did sugar cube again, and then we compared it against Saber, which was a little bit more of a French melon, which did okay, but not near what sugar cube did. So almost a nine rating, 100% of people who would recommend it. Um, I, you know, as opposed to the ambrosia, which was about a four pound fruit, uh, most of the time when we've done these sugar cubes, they've been anywhere between two and three pound uh, fruit averages. I call this a personal size muskmelon. This is about as close as I get to culinary uh, expertise, but they were pretty fabulous on an August evening. So um, then we move a little bit into some uh, information on Watermelons, and so watermelons have a much thinner skin, uh, stems, more branched tendrils, and the our regular uh, dipwood um, watermelons are monoecious, but there are some nuances when it comes to the way that some watermelons are pollinated and, and grown. Um, and so some of the most important harvest cues for watermelons, which I also find can sometimes be a hurdle for folks, is that the tendril on the leaf closest to the melon will dry up. I don't have a good picture of that. I need to take a good picture of that. And then the underside will start to change from white to slightly yellow. And when it gets to deep yellow, we're getting close to overripe. So you can see we are very yellow on this uh, melon right now. So it's just on the edge. Um, watermelons have been something that we've gotten kind of mediocre. Uh, results in our trials. And so um, the first year that we did them, uh, we did a traditional kind of icebox melon, that starlight that you're seeing in the back and a orange flash melon, um, you know, didn't, didn't have fabulous uh, results. So we also did a compact watermelon uh, trial and, you know, you can see kind of mediocre uh, ratings. And what I have often found in getting evaluations back from gardeners in these trials is that plant stand was a critical issue. And so we'll talk about this a little bit when we get into some of the details of you know, germination and temperature, but I think that, and you know, sometimes I'm even guilty of this myself, um, watermelons are one of the highest soil temperature requiring crops. And so I think that we're often going in too early and we're really limiting our later yield by just not getting good stand, um, good germination and good plant stand in our trials. Um, last year, we did a really compact sugar baby bush as well as a uh, baby doll. And those were, um, baby doll was a small yellow fleshed fruit. And so people liked it. It was, you know, it was a little bit lighter fruit, you know, more, I think it was more in the eight pound range where a lot of our other fruit have been kind of 11 to 12 uh, pounds. But um, this past year was really the first year that we actually got some, you know, pretty good uh, reviews from some of the watermelons that we did in the trial. So it's not a great picture, but this uh, melon right here is sweetie pie. It's kind of a sugar baby type, really dark rind. And then this one that you can see just a little snippet is mambo. And so I always, in our variety trials, try to make sure that there's physical, um, visual differences in those fruits so that if they bind together, as watermelons tend to do, folks can still tell the difference between their melons. That's also the reason why we did some of those differences in flesh color as well. So both of these um, were right on the money for 75 days from seeding to harvest, and I direct seeded these. We'll talk a little bit about why I may not necessarily always do that in the future, um, but both of them were around 11 to 12 pound fruits, um, you know, both above seven rating and a pretty high recommendation range. So I feel like we're getting a little bit better um, in trialing watermelons for uh, some of our folks. So that's kind of an overview. And um, this final section, I just wanna share a little bit of information about some of what um, might be some 
uh, ways to address some of the hurdles that we see in growing uh, some melons. Um, first would be that soil texture and characteristic. And so melons prefer very well-drained soil of medium texture. So I always kind of smile when I say that because as you saw from some of my trial plots, we certainly have many spots and I would say that, I would assume that you all do as well where we tend to have some heavier soil, some of that um, clay. And, and so sometimes those medium textures uh, can be a little bit of a challenge. They're sensitive to high salts, which most of the time is an issue for us. And uh, they also don't like high pHs. So right in that you know, six to uh, seven range is good. Um, when we have heavier soils, that of course reduces aeration to the roots. Cucurbits are pretty sensitive about their roots not having good access to um, oxygen in the root zone. Um, so, you know, good structure would be very important if we're growing in heavier soils. Um, and if we have some of those heavier soils, which we're a little bit worried about drainage, then raised beds are good. In fact, raised beds are really always good for melons because it can warm up the soil a little bit faster. Most of the time, and of course this is true, certainly in commercial production, but even for those of us growing on smaller scales, um, raised beds that have some drip irrigation so that we can keep our leaves dry better for um, reducing disease pressure, as well as um, plastic to manage the weeds and increase the soil temperature. Um, one thing that um, I probably should pay a little bit more attention to in my trials is to not get too carried away with irrigation early on. And this may be true, y'all are just a little bit north of uh, my growing temperature here, that uh, moisture in the soil can cool the soil a little bit early on and potentially increase some of the damping off uh, and disease risks. So what are some of the keys to getting started well in our melon production? You'll, you probably, you've already heard me say it once or twice, but cucumber beetles are our challenge. That's actually a little uh, zucchini. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, soil temperature, seed protection, this aspect of direct seeding versus transplanting, and of course, planting at the proper time. So I know this is a little bit of a busy chart, but these, um, these days represent days from seeding to uh, good emergence from these crops at different soil temperatures. So the columns represent different soil temperatures and then for all of these different crops. And kind of the point of putting all of these days in there is for several of these common warm season crops, you can see oftentimes we'll say, yeah, wait till the soil gets to be 60 degrees. Okay, that's it's true. But what you really see is that if you can wait till the soil gets to 65 or 70 degrees, you will dramatically drop that time from seeding to germination. And on some of these, uh, you know, you can see cucumber, you save a week if you can get from 59 to 68. Um, some of this data was uh, incomplete. This actually comes from a UC Davis um, extension uh, fact sheet. Um, but you can see even how much difference there is between a 68 degree soil temperature and a 77 degree soil temperature. So muskmelons, watermelons absolutely fall in the category of really liking those warm soil temperatures. In fact, watermelons, their optimum germination temperature is more like 95. So you'll actually get just a little bit of a benefit by going from 86 to 95. I am not saying that we need to wait till we get to 95 degree soil temperature, but I just want to show you how much quicker germination occurs at these higher soil temperatures. It's good for timing, but it also means that our seeds are sitting in that soil for a much shorter period of time. So it's gonna decrease our opportunity for fungal diseases and damping off and a lot of those things. So we wanna be aware of what the soil temperatures are, whether or not uh, we are you know, literally sticking a soil thermometer in the ground or whether we're tracking it. This is actually a commercial um, site, but it's a really easy to use uh, resource for as far as uh, soil temperatures. And so I just wanted to show you, this is a little blow up. So I pulled this off the internet yesterday, uh, but you can see there's just the simple tracking between what is the average for five years or for 10 years 
And of course, I hope this is true. Yesterday was a gorgeous day here. I hope you guys uh, had it as well. So you could see yesterday we had really warm soil temperatures, but it was easy to tell from these numbers that those temperatures are uh, out of the norm and much higher than is usual. So this kind of gives you a, a simple way to see um, what some of the soil temperature looks like, even without having uh, your own temperature gauge. While we're talking about germination and seeds and seeding, I wanted to throw just a little bit of information in there specifically about watermelon. I should have said this when I was talking about the cultivar trials, but I'll say it now. All of the cultivars that we have trialed have been regular uh, diploid seeded watermelons. And that is because um, the seedless melons are picky about their germination temperature. The seed is expensive. And so they just weren't something that I was confident that shipping out our folks were going to have good success with. So we've stuck with the seeded cultivars and that's you know what I have the most experience growing. But as you certainly know from shopping and maybe even growing on your own, we have seeded and seedless options. And so Seedless watermelons are what we call triploid. Um, they are a cross between um, diploid, kind of our standard, which has two copies of every chromosome, and a tetraploid, which has been kind of manipulated to have four copies. So they're crossed uh, to produce this uh, triploid. And so those plants have seedless fruit because essentially they're sterile. And even if pollen you know, comes to the flower, fertilization typically doesn't occur. And if it does occur, then they abort that fruit and you might get some of those little thin um, kind of remnants of seeds that weren't, uh, that weren't fertilized. And so um, even though they're sterile and they don't produce viable fruit, pollination is still required because that pollination kind of helps stimulate the growth of the fruit. So if you're growing uh, seedless watermelons, and this is Another reason why we haven't included them in the, our home garden trial, because it's another kind of complicating step. You need to have some pollinizers that are in the field. So sometimes people pollinate, pollinate with just a regular kind of seeded cultivar. Now we're seeing much more you know, specialized types of pollinators, whether they're male lines, um, plants that produce really small fruit. So you can always tell the difference. So, um, in the world of seedless watermelons, there are a lot of impressive uh, challenges, but we and and advances, and we not won't necessarily get into all those details. But I just wanted to mention that key difference. So when it comes to seeds, we can grow the regular raw seeds, um, and there's a whole range of seed treatment that's available to us. This is kind of old school. So these are thyrum treated cucumbers, but there are a lot of commercial fungicides. We're seeing a lot more film coating that is available. And there are also some biological materials that you can use as a drench to kind of increase the activity of the native beneficial biological components of that soil to help protect against um, damping off and uh, degradation of those seeds. So especially if you are seeding kind of marginal soil temperatures, I would think about having either a conventional or some kind of an organic uh, fungicide. The big question that I probably actually maybe even changed my mind a little bit on over the last few years has been this question of to transplant or not to transplant. And so we talked a little bit about how 60 degrees Fahrenheit is kind of the minimum soil temper for, temperature for germination or root growth. But when you looked at some of those um, percentages and days to germination, you could see that actually getting above 75, even up close to 90 might actually be the optimum. Um, and so when it comes to watermelon, definitely, I would lean towards transplanting. And actually for cucumber beetle feeding issues, I would also lean towards transplanting even for some of the squash and the cucumbers. I'm going to do a little bit more of that in my trial this year. Um, cucurbits are fast growing plants. They have large cotyledons. So oftentimes just a couple or three weeks will be enough to create a transplant that's ready to go to the field. And the roots are sensitive to transplanting. So you want a media volume that's at least, you know, an inch and a half by an inch and a half. So not one of those tiny little uh, transplant trays. These dates are kind of Eastern uh, Kentucky dates. This is 
close to what we would say here in East Tennessee, but just a little bit um, later, like we may start, you know, more about May the 5th or something. And so this is from um, the uh, Southern Veg Crops uh, Guide. And most of the melons, I went back and kind of looked at my data over the past few years. And I have been right in that 70 to 75 days from seeding to harvest. Now, if you're transplanting, you could probably drop a little bit, uh, maybe 10 days or so off of that. Um, and the watermelons, sometimes, you know, we can get even later into the season on those, plant your watermelons at about the same time. You might plant your uh, pumpkins, you know, or some staggered planting to get different uh, productivity throughout the later part of that summer. Most of the melons, the watermelons that I've grown have been more icebox type. I haven't grown a lot of the really larger melons. And so most of the information that I showed you were right around that 75 days to harvest. But some of those larger fruit can get, um, get longer. Um, so when it comes to kind of planting and spacing in the garden, you can see this is a picture of um, some of our trials with like a mediocre uh, weed management. I do a lot of woven ground cover in between my rows because it's nice and porous and it keeps the fruit clean. And then the beds themselves have uh, plastic. Um, remember when you're planting that our cucurbits, cucurbits aren't great at producing adventitious roots. Their roots are kind of sensitive. So we want to be gentle when we're transplanting. Most of the time for melons, we'll put those anywhere from a foot and a half to two or three feet um, spacing in row. And then anywhere from about four to six feet between rows. Um, Lots of times because we can give them more water, give them more nutrition, and kind of provide a better growing environment for their roots. The plants might be spaced just a little bit closer on plastic culture or raised beds versus uh, bare soil. When it comes to watermelons, this is that uh, second bullet point there. Um, these are the vining types. Now there are some compact watermelons which we can put a little bit closer. In fact, that's kind of the reason why I included this picture. These are uh, some of the compact watermelons that we grew in the trial uh, last year. I think these are cow sweet uh, bush. So they can grow a little bit closer. But oftentimes um, for the compact one, I think I put those at two feet in row. For the more vining, about three to four feet in row. And then, you know, anywhere from five to eight feet uh, between rows. So the watermelons will give them just a little bit more room for per plant. Um, to mulch or not to mulch. And honestly, I'm not sure that I can come up with any good reason not to mulch. For these uh, melons that really like warm growing conditions, um, I think that mulching is, is just gonna be a good step for us all the way around. Um, you can see in some of our trials, I have used uh, plastic mulch with irrigation underneath. Um, I show you this picture of lettuce um, actually to make the point that one of the good things that we've been doing with the plastic mulch is using it as a second crop in the fall. So the reason that there are holes in the middle of this mulch bed is because this was the cucumber trial and then the cucumbers came out in August and the fall crops went in in September. So even though it is really a single year use, there are ways that you can get multiple crops out of it. So mulches increase the soil temperature, they moderate soil moisture, and they help us with weed control. Um, in terms of smaller scale and opportunities to have some material that you reuse for several years in your own home garden, there are some great opportunities to use ground cover or woven. So this is plastic, but it is porous to water because it is a woven material. And um, you can cut holes or you can burn holes if you uh, particularly like propane. These are some cool pictures um, from um, a grower who has actually um, cut or burned holes. And you can use this ground cover for multiple years. The purpose of burning is to have that be more of an edge that will stick, right? Because we melted the ends of those uh, woven ground cover strands together. Um, so from that discussion of uh, mulches, then it makes sense to talk a little bit about temperature. Melons, both types, certainly like warm weather. And so really good growth occurs above 70 degrees 
They don't like it 110, um, but kind of between that 70 to 90 degree window, which means that in the early part of the season, um, covers can actually be a really good way to increase that um, rate of growth of those young plants and provide them with just a little bit more of a temperature boost. And so this picture actually is of, of fall grown lettuce, but that small scale row cover is something that can be easily installed in a whole range of sizes of gardens and it can fit really well on raised beds. I, um, I actually use lath a lot when I use row covers. This is, um, this is uh, just lath that I bought in a bundle at Lowe's and I just um, roll it up and put ground staples there. It keeps it really tight. You can also tack it to the side of a raised bed. So there's lots of fun ways that you can use that. Um, if you're growing on a small scale, there's ways that you can provide support even uh, to those um, melons. So that can be um, a really great way to keep the fruit off the ground, keep it healthier, provide um, good air movement uh, through, the, through the canopy. Um, the, um, the element of pollination is really important for both of our types of melons. Um, even for our moss melons that have perfect flowers, they do need to be pollinated. Those male flowers are only open for just a day, um, but the um, perfect flowers are open for much longer and they require, this is just a really kind of amazing uh, number, 10 to 15 bee visits for, for good pollination. So if you have experienced reasonable plant growth, but you haven't seen um, great fruit production, it could be because the environment wasn't great for um, bee activity. Um, and so um, inadequate pollination can definitely be a reason why we see not great fruit production. The other element is that when plants are stressed, they tend to produce more male fruit. And so water or temperature stress can kind of more flat male flowers can kind of throw off the pollination uh, combination of some of these plants. Um, watermelon also uh, pollinated by bees. And one thing to think about for um, watermelon plants is that most of our you know, medium to large fruited cultivars can only support just a few fruit on their vine at a time. Um, and so they will um, sometimes abort fruit that has been set so that they can spend more of their energy investing uh, into the to fruit that they're really trying to, um, to fill out. Um, so when it comes to water and nutrition, um, melons have a pretty good and a moderately deep root system. So most of the time we'll use the recommendation of about an inch per week. One of the nuances of, of irrigation with melons is that we'll get better fruit quality, higher soluble solids, more sweet melons, if we, um, if we don't irrigate too heavily in the week or so before harvest. Now, in the climates in which we grow, this is a challenge, right? Because, you know, we're in the humid South. And so we get into August and it may be dry or we may get a lot of rain. And so I have always kind of had it as my goal to try to cut off irrigation, especially on my muskmelons when they get close to maturity. But it's not very often that I really actually pull that off successfully because we've had so many um, rainy Augusts for the past few years. Um, when it comes to nutrition, um, watermelons and muskmelons would fall kind of in that middle category. So we're not going to be feeding them quite as heavily as we would our tomatoes um, in the garden. Um, total nitrogen would be somewhere, you know, between one and a half and three and a half pounds for a thousand square feet if we kind of uh, use that in the garden terms. And most of the time, if you have irrigation, and especially if you're on plastic mulch, you can fertilize just a little bit more because those plants will have a little bit, sometimes larger biomass and opportunity to take advantage of that nitrogen. So depending upon how you grow, um, lots of times about a quarter to a half of that nitrogen and pretty much all of the potassium and phosphorus if you need it will be put on broadcast at the beginning of the season. And then about half if you're growing in the soil or about three quarters of that nitrogen, if you're growing with a way to irrigate or fertigate, 
will be applied um, as the plants grow. So most of the time, if you're growing in soil, um, you'll side dress or uh, top dress kind of when those vines start to run, or if you have a way to put irrigation on, then you'll do about a weekly uh, fertigation. Um, the, the last thing that I wanted to mention in this discussion about melons is this element of fruit quality. And so when it comes to really both of these types, um, high soluble solids is one of the main crucial elements in judging uh, fruit quality. And so, and actually um, soluble solids, which um, you might see it called bricks. So bricks is named after a, you know, a guy, um, but he was the one who kind of standardized this measure. And so um, a large percentage of the soluble solids that we would measure are actually sugar. So it's a good approximation for the sugar content of these melons. And so um, oftentimes at least 9% bricks would be kind of a standard quality melon. 11% would be uh, a fancy. Um, and what is really required for our fruit to have a high concentration of soluble solids? Well, it is good leaf material and good environmental conditions to carry out photosynthesis, right? It's the opportunity for them to make a lot of sugar. And so the ideal conditions would be having a healthy, large leaf canopy, and then warm, sunny days where they get to carry out a lot of photosynthesis and cool nights. And so um, certainly for us in Tennessee, now you guys might be just a little bit better than us as far as this opportunity for cool nights. And why are cool nights important? Well, because if we have warm days and warm nights, then those plants require more of that sugar during the nighttime to you know, respire and carry out cellular processes. And if the night is a little bit cooler, then they don't burn up as much of that sugar kind of keeping themselves going and there's more of it available to pump into their fruits. Um, so for watermelon, they're really, for, for musk melons, there are a lot of aroma characteristics that are very important for how we judge the quality of musk melons. For watermelon, not so much. It's pretty much sugar with a little bit of texture. And to get a decent quality melon, oftentimes we'd say about 7% uh, soluble solids. Um, watermelons don't slip, so they should be cut off the vine and they don't ripen after harvest. So for us, we do want them to get ripe in our gardens. And you know, I probably experienced it, you probably experienced it, one of the key um, overripe characteristics is the uh, watermelons get a little bit mealy in there. So you kind of learn um, what, that, uh, what that ripe indicator is um, there. So I think that uh, with that, I am going to um, stop my share. And uh, if anybody has any uh, questions or comments or any of these cultivars that you've grown and have good success with, then I'd love to hear from you all. Uh, Dr. Bumgarner, there was a question about um, the availability of some of those varieties you mentioned. Are they, they all uh, available now? Are they still in the trial stage? Um, those are, they are all out in trade. So every once in a while, we'll slip in a cultivar that hasn't been released. But one of our main criteria is that they're available for homeowners in not too large of a quantities. And so um, most of them, I mean, I order from a wide range of seed suppliers, Johnny's, Territorial, Harris, HPS, um, some like Southern Exposure for some of the heirlooms. But all of those are, you know, are pretty easy to, to get a hold of. Okay. And you Thank don't have to buy 1500 Um, yeah, for, for a rotation, um, most of the time for our cucurbits, you know, we'd be on that three to four years. And so, um, you know, I, I always think of it as like, you know, a corn, a tomato, a cucurbit, and, you know, an okra or sweet potato, 
something like that to you know make sure that we're getting you know widely different uh, crop families. And we, of course, we do grow a lot of cucurbits in our gardens, and they are space consumptive. And so it is true that you do kind of have to work a little bit to keep your rotations, you know, from cucumbers and squash and, you know, winter squash and melons. So it does take a lot of tomato and okra to run a good rotation there. I, I noticed the uh, heirloom melon that you showed, the Tennessee melon. Uh, there's one that pops up from time to time at our farmer's markets that I've seen, and probably Jeremy has seen this too. They call it an Appalachian banana. It looked, looked very similar, long and slender one, but uh, it didn't have the, the ridges. I'm assuming it's a, it's a similar type of, of melon. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that I've ever grown the Appalachian uh, banana. But I mean, those, those old time Tennessee melons, they were cool. They had a very large interior cavity. And I mean, you know, the flesh was of decent thickness, but you definitely had quite a bit of rind that you trimmed right. away. You weren't exactly eating, you know, the whole. Um, so cucumbers definitely cross pollinate each other. You know, they're seed and seedless, um, but cucumbers, don't cross with uh, muskmelons or with watermelons. Um, most of the time for cucurbits, and this is a is kind of a, a generalization, but the, the most we'd have to worry about cross-pollinating would fall in some of our squashes. Our um, cucumbers, our uh, cucumus um, sativus, and our muskmelons are um, Cucumis milo, and even those aren't close enough to uh, to cross pollinate, and watermelons are even just a little bit further away. We can get some funny squashes cross uh, pollinating. Oh, Georgia rattlesnake! I haven't uh, I haven't grown those. Um, yeah, those, I mean, those giant melons are, uh, are impressive. I tend to stick a lot more to kind of the 11 to 15 uh, pounders, mostly because there's just so much work to get out of the field when we get into those large fruity cultivars. Um, squash bugs. Oh, yeah. When you talk about um, cucurbits, we could spend a whole evening just on pests and, uh, and diseases. Um, so they are, I mean, they're definitely best controlled at the immature stages. Um, and you know, on a small scale, you know, you can kind of do the lay the board, squash the squash bugs. Um, but in very high population levels, it would probably be hard to, um, to, you know, get that much control. Um, at that at that level, and so you might need to move on to some kind of uh, insecticide. And there are both conventional as well as some biological options available for you there. But it's it's kind of a timing issue getting the spray on when you're still at the immature stages, because once you get to those mature, it's it's just really hard to get any any control. I have not used diatomaceous earth, and so I'm, I don't have a great opinion on that. I don't know, Phil or Jeremy, if, you, if you've used it. Uh, very little, just, uh, just against slugs. That, that's about the most I've used, used it yeah. for. Now. Yeah, those really soft-bodied pests. I don't know if squash bugs would be sensitive enough to for it to be very effective there. Um, when, you, when you start getting into the pumpkin and the squash cross-pollination category, it gets a little bit more complicated because pumpkins are kind of a general term. And so there are actually multiple species 
of pumpkins, you know, like some of the little ones are a different species than some of the big ones. So um, it gets the lines get a little bit more complicated. Um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I just say, did you see this one? There's one uh, asking about uh, melon seedlings. Where do you order melons? Oh, um, that is a good question. So actually, I guess I didn't say that very clearly when I was talking about transplants. Most of the time, I, I mean, I grow my own melon transplants because, you know, a couple, three weeks, they're really quick uh, to turn over. Uh, most, I mean, most of your local garden centers will have melon seedlings. And uh, one of the reasons why I like transplants a little bit more, especially if you have high cucumber beetle feeding damage is because cucumber beetles really like those young, immature plants. And if you can get transplants in and they're three or four weeks old, then sometimes you can um, get a little bit past the most damaging stage of cucumber beetles, which is why I'm going to be doing a little bit more uh, transplants. There are some mail order places that you can get melons, but probably your local garden center would be the best uh, source. This year I'm actually doing grafted uh, muskmelon trials for the first time. So I don't have any, you know, amazing uh, results or anything to share, but I'm a growing ambrosia, which is, you know, kind of an old fashioned muskmelon that people really love the taste of, but it doesn't have fusarium common soilborne disease resistance. And so that's kind of why I'm doing the grafting to, to get some fusarium resistance on kind of that old favorite. A lot of watermelons are grafted in commercial production for, you know, for fusarium and some of those things as well. well looks like some positive comments. Any other questions for uh, Dr. Bumgarner before we, we close it down? Well, thank you again for speaking with us. It's been, been great. Really appreciate it. And, uh, and, and again, I think this has unlocked the mystery of, of melon production for a lot of our, our gardeners. So well, I hope it helps a little bit. I, I would say that I feel like melons are so, you know, related to the current environmental conditions that, you know, enjoy the good melon month or the good melon season and don't give up.